Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the res recent results in Turkey and the implications for Turkish society. Ajaz, this election in which we are getting the endorsement, as it were, of the presidential form of government, how do you see this for Turkish society and Turkish political uh, scenario? Uh, Prabir, I think this is a watershed moment in the history of Turkey. Uh, there is a moment of absolutization of power that uh, Erdogan has been seeking over the entire period of his tenure, first as a prime minister for three terms, then he became a president in 2014, and then there was the recent referendum last year, which changed the presidential system. The referendum was actually very narrowly uh, decided. Uh, they won only about 51% or so. But in this new system, which is actually Erdogan's um, way, way of, uh, you know, brainchild, um, you have virtually all the power of the, of the legislature and the executive concentrated in the hands of a directly elected uh, president uh, and the post of the prime minister is abolished and so on and so forth. So there is absolutization of power uh, institutionally uh, through the kind of process that I just talked about. You also have a situation in which, for example, 40% of uh, Turkey's uh, uh, generals are in, uh, are in prison. Uh, so are many other uh, military officers and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, a major political party the uh, HDP, uh, People's, uh, uh, People's Democratic Party, the, the presidents of that uh, uh, party had to fight elections from prisons. So, you know, you have a system in which within the last three years, about half or more of the administrative structure of Turkey has been uh, dismantled, half the judiciary has been fired, half the bureaucracy has been fired. So every institution has been decimated over a period of time with arbitrary power in which Erdogan has placed his own people to the point, you know, in the judiciary, for example, right. I give you, uh, you have a situation where you don't have enough judges. So freshly graduated a law students are being appointed judges and they don't even know what the rules in their own courtroom are. Uh, and you have, so this is a moment of an absolutization of power. What is also very, very um, worrying is that there is a very radical change going on in the educational system where the Islamization, uh, where he, he said in 2006, I am going to produce a new generation of, of Islamist youth. Uh, and that is going forward very fast. Uh, public schools are being dismantled in some cases, actually physically demolished. And new schools being created, This. Um, this uh, Imam Khatib schools, as they are called, which is the, their word for what in India and Pakistan we call madrasas. Uh, and uh, the, the, the entire neighborhoods, you don't have public schools, secular public schools anymore, and you have this. And all of these um, processes, I think, are going to now get even more accelerated. So this is a total transformation of Turkey, institutionally, socially, politically, in every respect. And this is a high point of that. The other part of it is that the presidential form of government, he has the right to also appoint judges. That's also that, not that, in the parliament. Yes, exactly. Right, right. And the that's parliament right, really right. has no. very little powers. Yeah, I mentioned only the legislature and the executive, but also the judiciary. And as the head of the religious affairs ministry, he's also the religious head. Because all these uh, 
Imam Khatib schools are actually state run. And he can, with his presidential power, he can legally demolish all the secular schools and replace them with uh, these Imam Khatib schools and uh, allocate immense amount of money. And right now they have huge allocation, new huge allocations for that and so on. So every aspect of Turkish society, the power is this new dispensation is presidential system as it as they as he's calling it but it's not a pre presidential system of the sort that they have in france or anything like that this is an absolute absolutist part this is actually quasi monarchical the sultan erdogan yes as people figured out 10 years ago this is um, this is the building of the sultan who is also something of the ceo of this new liberalized economy of um so he's part ceo part sultan uh, as some wit said um <laughs> you know so yes it's absolutely tyrannical monarchical part the other part is of course what's happened to the media that a number of media houses have been shut again a huge number of journalists have been either sacked or they have they're in prison or they're in exile Highest number of, of, of journalists in prison anywhere in the world. Yes. The largest number of journalists. Or, or in exactly, as you said. I mean, the, the number of professors who left the country, who, the ones who, who could manage to, but he has been impounding passports. Every civil servant or an academic or a journalist who gets arrested, the Passports are impounded, not for him or her, but also their families. So, you know, this is a, if a military had done it, you know, the Turks have always um, complained about military coups and so on. No military coup ever went that far. So you're also holding the families to hostage, as it were. Yes, I mean, the, the whole society is being held, held hostage. And, you know, the amount of, you know, just the numbers that one can keep rolling off, so, who are in prison, who, are, uh, who have been fired, who had to leave the country, etc. You know, those military coups, uh, uh, gruesome as they were, I don't believe reached this far in. And they never transformed society the way he has, he's, he's transforming society. So this is Muslim Brotherhood in power because absolutely, AKP absolutely. is really Muslim Brotherhood. Now we know what Muslim Brotherhood in power is and that is what was being feared in Egypt. That is what the problem was in Egypt that Egypt, the Egyptian society was caught between the devil and the deep sea. You had the Muslim Brotherhood on this side and very, very autocratic uh, and corrupt military system or the other. And you basically had a choice between the two of them. But it was very clear that if the Muslim Brotherhood really stabilized their rule in Egypt, this is what would happen. This is what they were fearing. And that was what they were writing into the constitution. Yeah. And this is the, you know, it's a great irony of history that the Muslim Brotherhood has come to power with such absolute control over state and society in the one country that was by far the most secular, certainly in the Muslim world, but I think next to the French, probably in the world. Um, and that's where, so it's, I mean, the grandeur of this achievement is also something one has to acknowledge that transforming a, a country so thoroughly Kamalist and secular and modern into this caricature is remarkable. Now, stepping away from the political, since you raised the larger picture of how the entire society, which was, as you said, Kamalist and secular, though, of course, it also had its authoritarian uh, side to it, but ah, never yeah, secular, secular, communist, authoritarian. Yes, yeah. but at the, same, <laughs> at the same time, 
this transformation from the strong secular, in fact, uh, really banning various even manifestations in public spaces like the fairs, the headscarf and so on, to this is a huge transformation. But what explains this? What are the social forces which allowed this to happen? Apart from the fact that, you know, there was, okay, there is always uh, something which is running, always has its critics. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what, what began to happen was a, a split in the, uh, in the very, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the very Turkish bourgeoisie, uh, where the old established bourgeois houses, capitalist houses, the old bourgeoisie, let's say the Istanbul bourgeoisie, was, um, was European, Western, Kemalist, whatever you want to call it, and so on. Uh, and then there, the, there arose what came to be called the Anatolian Tigers, which is from medium and, la and, and large towns of Anatolia, that large sort of uh, hinterland. There was that whole sort of big bourgeoisie, uh, I mean, which began to compete. And the entire, for example, export se sector of Tur Turkey that developed so rapidly was in the hands of those people. The trade with EU was actually in the hands of those people. Even the investment structures between EU and Turkey was usually an alliance. Uh, and uh, so when these people actually came to power, they were socially conservative, Islamist, but they were very much pro-EU. They wanted very badly to enter EU because of that. But so part of it in terms of classes, that is part of what happened. Part of it is that Kamalist secularism did never properly enter the countries are never properly transformed the countryside. They never properly uh, transformed the, the hinterland of Anatolia. I mean, I, uh, I remember going there first in the 70s and going to smaller cities there and getting frightened at uh, the really the difference and how much hold of the uh, imams and so forth there was in those petty little towns. Uh, so there was that, that uh, Atatürk actually made a compromise in which um, this the Ministry of Religious Affairs, he nationalized religion, he did not abolish it. <laughs> so it, so it, he thought he would control this phenomenon by appointing prayer leaders in every you know, imams and so forth in every mosque and uh, uh, creating endowments which were controlled by the Kamalist state and so on and so forth. Uh, but that taking that secularism deep into the socialist structures of the hinterlands in uh, Anatolia and so on, which was a very different kind of project than simply giving them, you know, uh, modern education, mathematics and science and so on and so forth. So there was that. And there was the transformation of um, cities like Istanbul, for example, where the, uh, as new liberalism began to come in, and that came in before uh, Erdogan came, uh, the victims of that whole process in the countryside began to flood into the big cities with their resentments against this high big bourgeois world of Turkey and so on. There were a number of processes of that kind, that sort of going on, all along the class scales, very different things, but began to gel. Uh, also and the Kurdish issue, because the, Kamal had, Kamalists had one problem, which is they did not accept any other identity except the Turkish yeah. identity as establishment yeah, of Kamalists. People don't, people don't remember that Kamal, wanted even a part of the Iraqi Kurdistan as his original map of Turkey included Mosul and this, that and the other, because he said these are Kurds and 
Kurds and Turks are one people. <laughs> For him and in the original constitution that, uh, that uh, he had, which was suppressed and came out in 1960, there was a clause for full social, linguistic, cultural autonomy for the Kurds. So this, this Turkish is one language and Turks are one country and etc. This anti-Kurdish business that later Kemalists actually um, uh, cultivated has nothing to do with the Tatuk himself. Um, actually, his his closest general was, was actually a Kurd, who briefly became the president. Um, Ismat Aluno, very famous, very famous uh, figure in the history of the Republic. Um, it was the closest um, ally of, um, was actually a Kurdish, who, who then became president. For a bit. So th this was not a that old, it's, <laughs> it's later day acolytes of that tradition who started doing that. And one of the things was that in the beginning, in the beginning, AKP was very, very clever. It understood that in the middle classes, liberal middle classes, there was a great hatred of the army's army for its repeated interventions in the economy. There was a desire for Europe and there was a desire for peace with the Kurds. And Erdogan's forces realized that the, the threat to them came from the armed forces. And they had to conduct a purge of the armed forces. And they therefore, uh, Erdogan and his party, um, <coughs> made all kinds of peace overtures towards uh, the Kurds. Uh, there was a period around, you know, 2006, uh, 7, 8, when I used to go to Turkey, and uh, and I found that the most left-wing intellectuals and activists were so pro-AKP because they were making friends of the Kurds and accepting the, the European human rights um, protocol for the re resolution of Kurdistan. Uh, so, you, so strategically, they were very clever. They won the liberal, modern, Kemalist middle class on the question of, uh, and split the Republican Party, the Kemalist Party, the Republican People's Party, because the high command and sort of, you know, the, uh, the diehards of the party remain anti-Kurds, but their middle class, Rehu, uh, became soft in the AKP on the Kurdish question, and so on. So, then, so they were also strategically very smart. Now that have brought everybody else together against them, do you think this is also the result of this election? That the Kurds on one side, the left forces, in fact, both are with the HDP in, uh, in this election as well as earlier, and in the political process that's taking place. But do you see a... Uh, sort of getting together of the HDP and the uh, CHP and all this kind of forces against this kind of authoritarian presidential rule? I mean, they have been in a certain sense together for now for uh, several years. This is, this is a process that has been going on. Um, it, just last year when the, there was this 257-mile uh, uh, march from Ankara to Istanbul, led by the, uh, by the Kemalists, uh, which culminated in a demonstration of 1.5 million people in Istanbul, which in India, you know, doesn't surprise you all that much, but in, for Turkey, it's a huge, huge number, 405, 1.5 million to be found in one place. Um, so there was all that. And again, they, they have won elections only uh, by, I mean, presidential election, he won only by 51 point, uh, some five percent or something. Uh, his party did not get a majority, uh, and so on. So there is a there is a polarization. There is a polarization, but strategically he has captured all the positions of power 
dismantled all the institutions. Now he'll be in power until at least 2023, which is the year, the, the Republic, which is the 100th year of the founding of the Republic. And in these years, uh, he will have time to consolidate institutionally and culturally and socially a lot. So what I would say is that there is a polarization. This polarization will only grow. But at the moment, the balance of power is very much in his favor. And if we see the rise of various, shall we say, right-wing forces in the world, this is obviously one kind of blueprint for the religion, those who use religion as an identity. And I'm really talking about Muslim Brotherhood, the Hindutva forces, even the Trumpist ethnic right uh, racist forces, if you will, that all of these are essentially on a similar project, dismantle the secular democratic state in some sense and replace it with a clear politics of this kind. Would you say this is a larger project? And I have been actually writing uh, on uh, certain concepts, one that I'm, I've been uh, um, <clears throat> writing on is the whole question of a new kind, historically new form of political state that is arising, which is, which provisionally uh, the term I use is post-democratic, although I'm still looking for a better uh, phrase. Um, a, a type of state that uh, combines elements, institutional elements of liberalism and a great deal of practical strategic elements of dictatorship and fascism. Uh, and uh, in, in some cases, they may be secular, although in countries like India and, and Turkey, the, 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 it, the crux is the religious identity that they have. So, uh, you know, so in the wake of a very great a secular consolidation, they have been able to create this massive religious identity, very powerful in both countries by now. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, elsewhere, it is race more than religion. Uh, in many places, it, race and religion get played together. It, it can be Catholic versus Protestant. It can be, uh, you know, the in, in the American case, it is religion is not the predominant element. Predominant element is race, but this business of the you know the Muslim ban and so on. We had again we have a situation where, um, uh, like Turkey in the United States, now all the three branches of, of state are in the hands of the Republican Party, and so on. So and, and so you you are seeing this emergence of the, the, as the as the system breaks down uh, and uh, the and it and the challenge from the left is still very weak um, you have this emergence of from the right of consolidation of this kind of hysterical kind so you know. some form of ethno nationalism taking the either race religion, Whatever yeah. I did, yeah, yeah, it finds yeah, convenient. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, sort of don't really use nationalism. I think I think they like saying nationalism. That's why I don't say it. Although in India, of course, is is redefinition of our nationalism. Of course, religious national. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but it's xenophobic. Phobic. It's a very hysterical form of of conducting politics when the rational forms are in a crisis, highly irrational forms. Yeah, right. That's how I actually see it, yeah. Thank you very much, Ijaz. Ijaz, I hope that we'll see your long article that you said you are finishing, that we hope that we'll, be, you know, we'll see it soon and we'll have a conversation on that as well. I think that would be very interesting for our viewers. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. This is yeah. all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click, watch our YouTube channel, 
and do visit our website.